Let us start with the discovery of electron by J.J. Thomson in 1897. Uh, in the figure, um, we can see the cathode ray tube used by Thomson for the measurement of charge by mass ratio or E by M ratio of electron beam. Um, see, uh, this type of um, glass tubes were used in physics starting from 1850s. Henrik Geisler was the first person who designed them. Um, electrodes are fitted at uh, both ends, um, are sealed into the, uh, into the glass tubes at uh, two ends so that uh, we can apply voltage in the tube. And uh, the, the, usually the glass tube will be connected to a, a gas pump to remove uh, gas from this um, tube so that the pressure inside the tube can be reduced uh, very much. Okay, In Geisler tubes, the typical pressure was uh, nearly 1 by 1000 times, uh, 1 by 1000th of 1 atmospheric pressure. Now that was in 1850s and then in 1870s, William Crookes, an English uh, physicist, he modified Geisler tubes. Uh, the main modification was that the pressure inside the, the Crookes tube okay, could be um, made very low. Um, um, let us say one millionth um, of, a, of one atmosphere. Okay, one, one millionth of one atmosphere. Uh, that much pressure uh, can be um, very very low pressure could be achieved um, by in, in the Crookes tube and uh, this is actually a Crookes tube and uh, Thomson redesigned this Crookes tube uh, to suit his purpose and uh, here these two in this side and this side you, the two metal electrodes are sealed inside the tube and they can be connected to external wires um, Okay, so this uh, usually negative voltage is supplied here. So this is a cathode and positive voltage is supplied here and, and a wire from here will be connected to these two anodes. Okay, so this, this will be anodes. And we can see, if you look carefully, you can see horizontal slits here. Okay, so when from cathode, uh, electron beam will be accelerated towards anode and it will pass through these small horizontal slits. So we get um, anodes are also, act, anode is also act, acting as uh, collimators. So a narrow beam of electron will reach here and here uh, you can see uh, two horizontal metal plates okay one side you can see here and the other side you can see here horizontal metal plates okay uh, they are used to apply an electric field along this vertical direction okay let us say this is the x direction so electron beam is passing along the x-axis and an electric field is applied along the y-axis and uh, these two are uh, poles of an electromagnet. When electric field, electric current is passed through this magnet, um, a magnetic field will be produced along z direction. Okay. So essentially, electron beam is passing through crossed electric and magnetic field. Crossed means mutually perpendicular electric and magnetic field. Here, electric field is acting along the y direction, and magnetic field will be acting along the z direction. So by switching on the different fields, either electric field or magnetic field or both, we can uh, deflect, uh, Thomson was able to deflect the electron beam to different uh, extents. And uh, on the other end of the tube, you can see a, a semicircular plate which is acting as a screen. When electron beam is incident on the screen, there will be a coating on the screen. A scintillation will be produced here, a bright spot. Okay. So as the spot moves, we can see, observe the deflection of the electron beam. So this was the, the instrument used by Thomson. This was patented by Thomson and uh, uh, after Thomson's discovery, in the next 20-25 uh, years, this particular instrument was used for the charge by measurement of the charge by mass ratio of many particles. And also Crookes tube was uh, later redesigned in uh, around 1910. Uh, as um, this triode valves used in electronic circuits before transistors. And uh, another development was cathode ray tubes uh, used in early television monitors, television screens. Uh, this Crookes tube or we can say cathode ray tube was responsible for uh, two important discoveries in physics. In 1895, um, X-rays were discovered using this type of um, glass tubes. Essentially X-ray tube is a, a redesigning of this cathode ray tube. And in 1897, in the measurement of charge by mass ratio of electron. 
Okay, so that is the uh, the, the history uh, of this cathode ray tube, and now we can go to the actual measurement of uh, Thomson's experiment for the measurement of charge by mass ratio. Now this is the same figure of the cathode ray tube that we have seen in the previous slide. On only difference is that uh, now uh, the cathode is on the left side and the, the screen is on the right side and the electron beam is moving from left to right okay now the the main figure of this tube is the same one in thomson's uh, paper in april 1897 announcing the the measurement of charge by mass ratio of electron so we are using thomson's same figure uh, i have added some extra lines uh, showing the direction of motion of this uh, uh, the path of the electron beam Okay, so look at this figure. Um, this cathode is having negative polarity, and uh, you can see um, positive polarity applied to the uh, to the anode here. And uh, these two have a, a horizontal slit, so they act as collimators also. So electron beam from the cathode is accelerated to the anode, so we get a narrow beam here. Now, once the electron beam comes out of this uh, anode, okay. Um, this uh, red dashed line represents the, the path of the undeflected electron beam. It goes straight and strikes the screen at the point O. Now, once the electron beam comes out of the, the, the collimators, uh, it's, uh, there is no longer any force along the x-axis. Uh, see, look at this uh, coordinates. Um, horizontal direction is x-axis, uh, vertical direction is y-axis, and uh, towards U is the z-axis. Okay? So, electron beam passes horizontally and there is no force in this uh, setup, there is no force, no longer any force. After, there is a horizontal force uh, between cathode and anode accelerating the electron beam. But uh, once it comes out of the two collimators, okay, second collimator, um, or once it comes out of the anode, we can say, uh, there is no longer any force along the x-axis. Uh, so, the x component of velocity of the electron remains constant throughout. Okay. Now here, um, there are the horizontal metal plates that you remember from the previous uh, figure. Let us say the, uh, the, the positive polarity is applied to the top plate and negative polarity to the bottom plate. Then electron beam will be deflected upward and uh, strikes the screen at the point M if you apply only the electric field. Why? Because electrons are negatively charged particle and it will be deflected towards the positive plate. Actually, when a charged particle is moving perpendicular to a uniform electric field, we have applied a uniform electric field here, it moves in a parabolic path. We can show that this path of the electron beam deflecting upward is parabolic within the electric field. Once it comes out of the electric field, it goes straight, tangentially, and strikes the screen at the point M. Now, suppose instead of the electric field, we apply only magnetic field. The, where is uh, this region of the magnetic field? I have not, uh, the, the magnetic poles are not shown in this figure. This uh, green dark uh, dashed line represents the area of the magnetic field. Uh, from the previous uh, photo of the cathode ray tube, you can imagine uh, one pole um, I mean, in front of the tube and the other one behind. So, this uh, direction of the magnetic field is along the z direction. Uh, it is perpendicular and inward. Uh, look at this. Um, symbol standard symbol that we use perpendicular and uh, inward so um, so if you apply only magnetic field to, to this undeflected beam there is magnetic Lorentz force q into v cross b uh, so what is the direction of this force um, horizontal v is along the x direction right uh, because the electron beam is traveling along the x direction and b is per so it is plus x direction b is perpendicular and inward that is minus z direction then v cross b is along plus y direction this you have to verify okay v cross v cross b will be along the plus y direction but uh, direction of magnetic lorentz force is q into v cross b here q is actually minus e electrons charge is negative so uh, the direction of deflection of the beam will be opposite to v cross b which is minus y direction so the beam will be deflected downward and it uh, strikes the screen at the point, let us say, N. So, the most original aspect of Thomson's experiment was a clever way to, to measure the horizontal component of 
uh, the x component of velocity of the electron beam and what he did was um, we will see why he required a x component of velocity but let us see how he measured it what he did was now we see that when you apply only electric field the beam will be deflected upward okay when you apply only magnetic field the beam will be deflected downward when there is no electric no field no electric field no magnetic field the beam will go straight and strikes the point o so what thomson did was he applied both electric field and magnetic field okay these mutually per, you can see that the electric field is along the y direction magnetic field is uh, electric field is actually along the minus y direction and magnetic field is along the minus z direction they they are mutually perpendicular such uh, electric and magnetic fields are called crossed electric and magnetic fields so thomson applied crossed electric and magnetic fields okay and uh, so the electric force is along plus y direction magnetic lorentz force is along minus y direction they are they are mutually they are in opposite directions and he tuned the value of the electric field capital e and the magnetic field capital b until again he got an undeflected beam at the point o okay that is even in the presence of crossed electric and magnetic field he got an undeflected beam what is the condition for that the electric force along the minus y direction should be balanced by the magnetic lorentz force along the uh, electric force along the plus y direction should be balanced by the magnetic force along the minus y direction right so we have to if you equate the mag uh, the, the magnitude of the forces let us see what happens okay i will write here uh, I will write on the right side uh, here. So uh, we can write electric force that is QE is equal to magnetic Lorentz force, okay, which is Q Vx P. Vx is the horizontal velocity which is perpendicular to the magnetic field, okay. Vx is the x component of velocity which is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So this component should appear in this expression. So electric force is equal to magnetic Lorentz force. This Q is actually minus E, charge of the electron. Um, so Q, charge of the electron will cancel on both sides. What you get is X component of velocity is equal to E by B. Okay. So this was a very clever way a very brilliant idea to measure uh, the x component of velocity of the electron so actually the ratio we, we what we get x component of velocity as the ratio of electric field and magnetic field when we get an undeflected beam in the presence of simultaneous electric and magnetic field cross electric and magnetic fields actually this uh, way of measuring the, the the velocity is a particular technique uh, which is called velocity selector Okay. Thomson was the first person who employed this technique, this velocity selector technique. That means uh, when you when you apply uh, cross electric and magnetic fields and tune the electric fields and magnetic electric field and magnetic field to get an undeflected beam, always the the x component of velocity, horizontal component will be like this ratio of electric field and magnetic field. So um, wh what is what you are doing is uh, from a beam of particles, you are picking up. Uh, those particles having a particular velocity or a, a narrow a, a narrow band of velocities around a particular value okay so this is called this technique is called velocity selector and uh, after thomson successful measurement of charge by mass ratio of electron this velocity selector technique has been used widely um, to uh, in, in the in the mass spectrograph mass spectrogram um, of uh, different charged particles okay that is another story um, <clears throat> now let us see how he um, used this x component of velocity to calculate the charge by mass ratio of electron so i have drawn um, look at the the left side uh, i have drawn this uh, metal plates here okay positive plate and negative plate the separation between the plates is d and the length of this metal plates is l so we initially we get an undeflected beam at O. When you switch on the electric field, the the the, the electric, electric electron beam will travel along a parabolic path, 
uh, when it leaves the electric field it will it will travel in a straight line tangentially tangential to the parabolic path and uh, strikes the screen at the point m now um, the maximum deflection along the y axis along the y direction will happen when the just at the moment um, the electron leaves the electric field okay so let us call it theta now from this uh, triangle um, so i will write here below this uh, figure on the left side from this triangle you can okay let me continue um, so uh, from the figure on the left side we can write tan theta equals vy by vx where vy is the y component of velocity of the electron beam and vx is the x component of velocity now this tan theta is very small because uh, electron is deflected through an angle theta only for a small distance l the, the length of the metal plate is very small compared to the actual distance the electron beam is traveling so theta is very small only a very small deflection happens along the y direction so tan theta when theta is very small tan theta is approximately theta so we can write theta equals vy by vx okay um see uh, the x component of velocity already we have obtained as e by b now let us see what is the y component of velocity how does the electron get y component of velocity uh, look at the undeflected beam there is only x component of velocity but when uh, we know that magnetic field does not do any work so it does not change the um, the velocity of the electron but who changes the velocity of the electron along the y direction is the electric field when the electron reaches the metal plate what happens is there is a uniform electric field along the y direction so uh, along the actually electric field is along the minus y direction so there is a an electric force along the plus y direction since the electric field is constant this force is also constant e into small e into capital e where small e is the charge of the q into e okay where q is the charge of the electron so this is acting along plus y direction that is why electron beam is deflected upward in the electric field uh, so this uniform force along the y direction produces a uniform acceleration okay so which is the reason for getting a velocity along the y direction so the y component of velocity let us write here vy i can write as if the acceleration is uniform velocity change any change in velocity is simply acceleration into time uh, so ay y component of acceleration into t i am using capital t it is a total time taken by the electron beam to as it passes through the electric field to cross the electric field okay and what is this ay force by mass force is e into capital e here we need to take only the magnitude of the force okay the direction of force is along uh, plus y direction right that is because electric field is along minus y direction charge of the electron is minus e okay so q into e will be along the minus e into electric field along uh, minus y direction so the force will be along the plus y direction so the the signs have been taken care of by uh, uh, considering that the force is along the plus y direction magnitude of the force we can substitute here small e into capital e divided by mass of the electron so force by mass that is the y component of the acceleration now what is the time taken uh, for the electron um, beam to cross the uh, electric field okay look at the figure on the left hand side the the length of the metal plates is l okay and the time taken uh, to cross the that length l is simply distance by velocity okay uh, distance is l uh, the length of the metal plate and uh, the horizontal velocity is vx so we can write t is simply l by vx okay let us substitute this value so in the expression theta so theta is equal to right e by m into e into l divided by there is a vx uh, in the expression for vy and there is another vx in the denominator in the expression for theta so we have two vx we have vx square okay so i can rearrange this e by m is equal to theta vx square 
divided by e into i. Here theta we can measure uh, how much is the maximum deflection along the angular deflection along the y axis theta that we can measure from the geometry of this uh, uh, apparatus. You can work it out how to measure theta and the capital E is the applied electric field which we are applying right so we know the value L is the length of the metal pipe which we know so the unknown quantity is Vx horizontal component of the um, electron beams velocity and uh, that is we have calculated on the right side uh, using the Thomson's unique velocity selector technique Vx is E by V let us substitute the value here for Vx so Vx square is E square by B square so one uh, the value of one electric field will cancel from the numerator and denominator so what you get is uh, okay theta theta into e okay e square one e square will cancel divided by l b square correct e square by b square one e will cancel now um, you can further write this as uh, theta into instead of electric field I can say if the potential difference applied between the plates is capital V and uh, the separation between the plates is D electric field is simply potential difference divided by the distance. So this is some um, theta into V divided by B square L D that is the expression. Look at this expression theta we can measure from the geometry and capital V is the applied voltage that we know capital B is the applied magnetic field that we know L is the length of the metal plate we should know that D is the separation between the metal plate so all these are related to the geometry so <clears throat> from these um, values Thomson was able to measure the charge by mass ratio of the electron beam at that time in 1897 the value Thomson obtained was approximately 1 into 10 raised to 11 coulombs per kilogram okay 1 into 10 raised to 11 coulombs per kilogram see uh, this value uh, <coughs> this value uh, is an approximate value um, 1 into 10 raised to 11 coulombs per kilogram so in this particular experiment Thomson was able to obtain only the charge by mass ratio of the electron not electric charge and mass separately but uh, uh, he was he had also done similar charge by mass ratio measurement on ionized hydrogen atoms okay hydrogen atoms uh, in which one electron uh, the electron was knocked off so uh, at that time uh, it was called simply um, charged hydrogen atom okay now we call it uh, hydrogen ion so in, in using beams of hydrogen ions he was he had measured charge by mass ratio and it was nearly 10 raised to 8 coulombs per kilogram okay the value obtained here is 10 raised to 11 coulombs per kilogram this is charged by mass okay so there are two possibilities um, there are three possibilities mainly um, well, either the mass of the this particle cathode ray particles okay uh, these particles must be uh, some 1 by 1000 times less than okay mass of hydrogen atom because uh, mass becomes 1 by 10,000 times less then charge by mass ratio becomes 10,000 uh, 10, I mean 1 by 1000 times okay so uh, 1 by 1000 times less then the when then the charge by mass ratio becomes 10,000 uh, times higher instead of 10 raised to 8 becomes 10 raised to 11 so either mass of these particles are 1 by 1000 times that of uh, hydrogen atom or charge must be very large okay the, then also charge by mass ratio can increase charge must be uh, 1000 times greater or there is a combination of these two okay so the, there is a possibility that uh, um, these particles could be having mass uh, very less compared to even that of hydrogen atom okay then uh, what uh, Thomson did further experiments he uh, did this same charge by mass ratio measurements uh, using different cathode materials okay uh, then he showed that uh, he get the same charge he got the same charge by mass ratio even if cathode materials were different so this charge by mass ratio is independent was independent uh, shown to be independent of um, cathode ray materials ca sorry cathode materials 
and uh, he used a different gases inside this uh, discharge tube um, then also he got the same value so it was independent of the nature of the gas and uh, also um, these particles were found to be the same as those emitted uh, during photoelectric effect uh, measurements so from these uh, repeated measurements uh, experiments thomson concluded that these particles must be a universal constituent of matter in his 1897 paper and in his talks at that time he raised this possibility that there must be some very small constituents very small fundamental constituents of matter of atoms uh, but the conclusive evidence came uh, some two years later in 1899 see uh, one of thomson's students uh, was uh, ctr wilson he had uh, uh, discovered that um, ions act as uh, condensation centers for water drops when uh, damp air was cooled by sudden expansion okay this type of uh, air is called uh, or vapor is called super saturated vapor okay when uh, so super saturated vapor or damp vapor was suddenly uh, expanded then it cools and condensation can happen so if ions pass through this uh, air ions will act as condensation centers actually tom wilson developed this idea later um, to 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 design the first cloud chamber okay wilson was the person who invented cloud chamber okay so uh, what uh, thomson and his students did in 1899 was they um, made measurements on charged clouds okay and to estimate the electric charge Um, that the charge of the electron and uh, they found that the electron's charge uh, can be between uh, 1.1 into 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb to 2.3 times 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb they, they they were able to set a range for the possible electric charge of the, these particles 1.1 into 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb to 2.3 into as high, high as 2.3 into 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb it was um that they are estimating 1899 but there were uh, this measurement technique was inaccurate because um, thomson in, uh, had to introduce some approximations in the in the calculations so which made this uh, technique inaccurate but this technique uh, was very important in three senses um one is that it gave us uh, a, a a range of possible values for the electric charge it's of the order of 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb that was important and secondly it was the first uh, use of cloud chamber technique in physics okay and thirdly this type of thomson's attempt to take a measurement of the measurement on uh, charged clouds this uh, attempt earlier attempt gave robert millikan the idea of taking more accurate measurements on charged drops instead of using charged clouds millikan used the charged drops that was millikan's oil drop experiment uh, in in 1909 to some 1913 in, in, in an extended set of measurements he accurately measured the charge of the electron and he was using charged drops but he got this idea from thomson's uh, earlier attempts okay so we can conclude um by 1899 thomson was able to measure or estimate that charge of the electron must be of the order of 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb okay he was able to show that charge by mass ratio is of the order of 10 raised to 11 coulomb per kilogram okay so if we take the ratio charge divided by charge by mass we get 10 raised to minus 30 kilogram so the the mass of the these particles okay must be of the order of 10 raised to minus 30 kg now the mass of the lightest atom it was known that the mass of the hydrogen atom uh, was known at that time okay so if you compare these two uh, the mass of one hydrogen atom is approximately we you know 1.67 times 10 raised to minus 27 kg so if you compare these values uh, uh, he thomson concluded in 1899 that uh, mass of these new particles that he he detected uh, their their mass is nearly 1 by 2000 times mass of hydrogen atom lightest atom so this was the conclusive evidence to 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 predict to to declare that these particles these electrons are 
fundamental constituents of matter they must be present in all atoms okay the name electron was coined uh, a little earlier in 1891 by johnstone stony an english physicist uh, johnstone stony uh, he introduced this term electron to uh, to refer the fundamental measure of electric charge okay so uh, initially thomson was using another term he called them corpuscles these particles and then uh, very soon uh, the term electron was attributed to this particle so this was the way thomson measured the charge by mass ratio in 1897 measured the charge approximate charge in 1899 and concluded that the these particles these electrons must be um, uh, fundamental constituents of matter in 1906 uh, nobel prize in physics was awarded to jj thomson he is uh, he was usually referred by his colleagues and friends by jj so in 1906 nobel prize in physics was awarded to jj for his discovery of uh, electron okay um these are the presently accepted values of um, electric charge mass and uh, charge by mass ratio of electron um 1.602 177 into 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb actual decimal points will go to a large number i have uh, rounded off to six decimal points okay and uh, mass is 9.109384 into 10 raised to minus 31 kg charge by mass ratio 1.758820 into 10 raised to 11 coulombs per kilogram and uh, the reference for these values are national institute of standards and technology nast usa uh, this uh, hyperlink you will give you the site okay you can look into that site site so uh, once it was understood that there must be particles um, for example electrons which are smaller than the smallest atom hydrogen atom then the question is uh, then then it was understood that atoms are not indestructible okay there are something smaller than atom so atoms must be made up of smaller particles then the question was um, um, aroused uh, that is uh, what what can what is the structure of the atom okay Thomson was one of the first persons who proposed an atom model. So Thomson's atom model was proposed in 1898. Uh, it is something like this. He assumed that uh, the, the the positive charge of the atom must be uniformly distributed over a sphere. Okay, a uniformly charged positive sphere. And uh, these new particles that he had discovered, uh, these electrons, electrons must be distributed randomly on this sphere. Uh, this is often referred to as a plum pudding model okay so uh, consider um, uh, this, uh, this positively charged nucleus as a plum pudding a plum cake and uh, just like uh, we uh, raisins on a cake on a plum pudding uh, electrons are distributed um, different 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 uh, points on this plum pudding this was uh, proposed in 1898 now 6 uh, years later in 1904 uh, thomson and also independently a japanese physicist uh, nagaoka they independently proposed uh, a planetary model of the atom also uh, in in which uh, this was in thomson's case it was a modification of his plum pudding model in this planetary model thomson and nagaoka independently they argued that these electrons must be revolving around a common center okay so thomson uh, these two persons had a planetary model of the atom also but the idea basically is that the electric charge is uniformly distributed over a uh, over the entire spherical atom okay this was thomson's atom model 